much. Um, I generally want to, there's a rule to start a presentation with a joke, but I'd prefer not to share too much about my life at this moment. <laughs> Great, like <laughs> a good like 10% of the audience will get my ridiculous sense of humor. Uh, if it's not immediately obvious, uh, I work at Cellspace. If anyone wants to contact me, uh, I'm in the way of my own contact details. I don't know if everyone can see that. Uh, it's Amy at Cellspace or find me on Twitter at The Monks. Uh, I really value any kind of feedback or if you want to send me information because obviously there's always more that I can learn. Uh, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm currently a junior security analyst at Telspace. Uh, I like to refer to myself as a recreational researcher because I do like to learn. Uh, and I'm an OSINT enthusiast. Uh, a little bit of my, my background is that I'm actually an architect. Uh, so the kind of background from that profession has taught me that if you want to learn how to break something, it's best to know how to make it in the first place. And as Keegan so kindly introduced me, uh, my talk today is called Put Words in My Mouth. And really what I want to find out is, can I steal your voice? Can anyone identify this for me? Exactly. It's such an iconic image. And Kit is just one of the few characters that um, is one of voice assistants in any kind of film or uh, uh, popular culture reference where we see some kind of uh, AI system that is very intelligent and can speak back to us. And it's definitely had some kind of long-lasting impression. And we continue to see it in movies. Uh, the most recent one that kind of comes to mind for me is Jarvis in The Avengers. And it seems to be some kind of thing that's just becoming more popular. And I think that because you have something that's got some kind of cool factor, it's really... Uh, fun to be able to speak to a machine and get some kind of information back. But when you couple that with convenience, people are really going to go for it. Uh, it's so convenient to be able to say to a machine, okay, Google, what's on my calendar for today? Or what's the weather like? You know, what's not to like about convenience? And when you start to look at really reliable statistics, uh, we see that there's already one billion Google Assistant devices that are already in use. That's a fairly big number. So these voice assistants uh, and IoT devices that have some kind of microphone in them are just becoming more and more popular. So if we look in about five years time, that's uh, 75 billion devices. I don't know how uh, accurate this is, but it just gives an idea of the kind of popularity of these devices. I read an article recently which referred to IoT devices as the infiltration of things, which I think is quite a nice way to think of them. If you're buying from a reputable brand like uh, Google or Amazon, your, your odds of getting some kind of updates are quite high because these brands are they have security awareness and they're not going to want to sell a bad product. But there's also a lot of cheap devices which have no way of updating their firmware or their software, so what you buy is what you're stuck with. And the problem is, is that if you do have some kind of vocal um, voice assistant, they are designed to always be listening. It's because they're waiting for that keyword so that they can hear your instruction or your question and that they can answer you. And always listening means always recording. And uh, both Google and Amazon have confirmed that human staff uh, QA the recorded audio just to check that the information that is uh, returned to you by this device is uh, accurately answering your question. But that brings into question things like trust in your privacy because even though these large brands are saying, yeah, it's anonymous, there's no way to tie these recordings back to you as a user, that's absolute nonsense because to have a Google Home Assistant, you have to have a Google account, which means that there's obviously a way of tracing you back. Uh, another huge problem with IoTs is that there's best practice versus regulations, and if manufacturers are not uh, forced to do something, and it's more work and more money for them, odds are that they're gonna uh, ignore it in part of the development. Obviously as well, where is your data stored? And if there's a breach, like any breach, it's a problem. But here we're, we're using your personal data. 
But if we just kind of pause for a second, I wanted to understand how machines understand human speech. So then to understand that, we have to learn very basics about how a voice is made. And that essentially happens in two parts. So there is the part of your body that makes the sound. That's really just vibrations that happen in your throat. And it's the equivalent of the strings of a violin. Uh, and these are known as your vocal folds. The second part that's involved is uh, what shapes the sound. So the equivalent is the body of a violin. And these are known as your supralaryngeal articulators. Supralaryngeal articulators is just a fancy name for everything that happens kind of from the neck up. It's your nasal cavity, your mouth, your lips, everything that helps you articulate words um, so that you can make a sentence. Uh, but really, all that we're doing when we speak is that we're making noises, um, and our brains are able to interpret that quite naturally as human beings. But when we break these down, they're known as phenomes, and there's quite a lot of similarity, as you can see, because if you say the two sentences out loud, recognize speech and recognize speech, it's very difficult for a machine to be able to um, differentiate between the two. You then add in a whole bunch of other stuff like homonyms, which are quite obvious, uh, which would be easy for a human and a little bit more difficult for some kind of software, as well as things like our accents, uh, how fast do you speak, do you speak clearly, what's your enunciation like, um, and then also certain other elements that I haven't put on here like your microphone quality, um, speaker quality, all things like that. So. How software understands what we're saying. It's really just making a very educated guess and context. So it's going to try to understand words in a series. It's going gonna, it's gonna to see how likely it is that you're asking about something, and it's going to return that answer to you. It's worth uh, noting that a lot of this takes a huge amount of processing power. And when you issue a request to a device like a home speaker voice assistant, uh, all that device does is it records it and it sends it, uploads it, and s it's processed somewhere else because the d that small device itself does not have the processing capacity to do it then and there. Uh, so once we speak to a machine, uh, that is captured graphically in one of two ways. Uh, the images here, the one is a, um, a wave and the other, the bottom one is a spectrogram. This is a voice print of the word yes. Uh, once you understand kind of what is being said, it becomes a little bit easier to read these graphics. Uh, so it's actually broken up quite nicely here with the red lines, uh, each letter of yes. Um, the, the raw wave is, a, is quite a simplified way of looking at sound. The spectrogram is a little bit more uh, in depth because it's actually helping to measure energy. Your lighter parts of the diagram are more energy and your darker are less. Um, there's actually people who view uh, spectrograms and try and identify what's actually been said. Uh, as far as voice verification goes, so there's generally two systems that are used, uh, text dependence and independence. Dependence is obviously quite easy uh, concept to understand. Uh, the passphrase that's used in some kind of uh, verification process is the exact same phrase that's used uh, when you sign up or create the account. The independence is using characteristics of your voice instead of an exact kind of match. So that is a little bit more technical as a system. The problem with unique is that we've always been sold this idea that everyone is different um, and we're all special. But I'm of the opinion that that's not necessarily the case. Um, if, if these studies on kind of uniqueness have been done on sample groups, it's, it's using a very limited amount of people. And there's absolutely no factual way to know if your fingerprint or your iris or your voice is absolutely unique. Uh, as well as the fact that we're just creating more and more of our, or putting more and more of our data online. So, if uh, some kind of voice authentication becomes very popular, and it's an unrealistic, but just work with me here, if every single person on earth used their voice as some kind of authentication and it was stored in a database, 
that's a several billion people, right? But now if that information is stored and you keep adding every year that people are born and add their voice onto the system, in 10 years' time, you wind up with a huge amount of people and it just lowers your odds of being unique. This ties into Poppy or Papaya, which I think everyone is familiar with. Um, your voice is covered as a biometric um, as biometric data, as something that belongs to you. And the reason why this is troubling is because verbal agreements are no less binding than written agreements. So if you, if you phone someone and you make some kind of contract, so if you phone your lawyer and you ask them to do something, uh, that's law. Generally, verbal agreements are difficult to prove, but if it's recorded, it's no different from a contract. And that's why having your voice spoofed is undoubtedly theft. So there was a lot of speculation about it, people just speaking about what would be possible, and then it actually happened. So in September, there was a company that uh, had $243,000 uh, transferred because uh, one of the senior managers received a call from the CEO, allegedly CEO, uh, requesting this payment to be made. Um, Reports of this say that the voice was done so well, it even had the CEO's uh, accent down to a T, and the only reason they found out, or they found out sooner that this was a spoof, because once the first transaction was successful, <laughs> the, the criminals phoned back and asked for a second amount. Not dodgy at all. Uh, at the moment, uh, these kind of attacks require quite a lot of preparation, time, expertise, and resources. So it's not a simple thing to kind of carry off. But like anything, these things get better. Uh, it becomes much easier. And at the moment, only your higher profile individuals are at risk. Um, I want to kind of contextualize higher profile because I think that if someone incredibly famous contacts you, you might be a little bit skeptical. But if it's a CEO of, of a company and he phones someone else within the company and asks for some kind of very urgent payment to be done, it, it can be quite believable. Um, this video, which you would have seen and now will not see, um, is a spoof of Joe Rogan's voice. Um, this was not done with his permission. Uh, he was an, uh, a brilliant target because he has such a huge amount of data online. I don't know if anyone watches his podcasts. It's several hours every week. He has the perfect data set uh, for someone to spoof his voice. Um, even he was scared by these results. Um, they were really, really good that you will not see. Uh, here as well is some audio that you will not hear. <laughs> um, so obviously Google are really good at what they do, and I think most people in this room will be familiar with the, uh, the Google Voice. Uh, what's interesting is when I tried to find out who she is, they haven't disclosed her name. Um, but their tool is becoming so good that it's starting to be people when they listen to a recording by this voiceover artist, versus a generated um, audio sample, people are struggling to tell the difference between what's real and what's not. Uh, I was gonna get you guys to guess, but here's the answer. Uh, I'm hoping, I think I would really like to put this online just if anyone's interested in actually seeing the videos that are in this presentation, my humble apologies. Um, this video is shows Google's duplex. Uh, duplex is gonna be Google's assistant. Uh, what's incredibly amazing about this software is that you can say again to your, uh, your voice assistant, uh, please book a haircut for me on this date between this time and this time. Uh, and this software will phone your hairdresser and will have a live discussion with the person on the other end of, of the line. Um, when Google tested this, the, the targets that they phoned were not aware that they were part of this testing. Um, and this duplex was able to make the appointment flawlessly. As far as tools that are available, so there are several. Uh, the easiest one is the second on this list, uh, known as Liabird. Uh, if anyone is interested, you just go onto Google, type in Liabird. Um, your first results may be for the actual bird itself. Uh, but just look for the voice spoofing tool. Uh, 
it will give you sentences to read, uh, and I think you, you only need a small data set for it to be able to spoof your voice. So if you're interested, have a look at that. Um, a, a more technical tool that has been developed by Google is known as Tacrotron. It's definitely nowhere near as user-friendly as something like Lyrebird. Um, you will need a certain graphics card and a little bit of experience behind a terminal to be able to get it working. Uh, Adobe had put together a beta version of a program called Voco. Um, it was kind of going to be marketed as the Photoshop for voice. It was never released, but it also had incredibly good results. What's worth mentioning here as well is that these, all of the software has a legitimate application. So if you consider maybe there's a film set and um, the sound guy was maybe not doing his job properly and they lost a few seconds of data from one of the actors in the movie, you don't necessarily want to get that actor into studio um, to just record two or three words. So you can use software like this just to generate the, the, the words that you're missing. Um, any kind of uh, call center is able to use this application to set up their kind of their menu, make it interactive, uh, as well as people who suffer from any kind of uh, muscular degenerative di uh, diseases. If they don't want to lose their voice, they can make a uh, copy of it and then still be able to express themselves using their voice. So I don't know if anyone saw either of these uh, applications online. Uh, the first, uh, on the left, fake app, uh, what it did is that it took video or image and you then supplied a different person's face and what it could do is that it could put the second person's face very convincingly in the uh, video or the image that you provided the tool. Uh, it wasn't online for very long. Um, it got taken down shortly after it was released. Um, if you do some careful kind of searching, you're still able to find it though. The second one that's worth mentioning is Deep Nude. Uh, it worked, <laughs> what the hell is that timing? <laughs> I mean, we couldn't have planned that better if we tried. <laughs> um, so Deep Nude worked on a similar kind of, um <laughs> Serious, Manny. <laughs> All right, so what Deep Nude did is that you would provide it with a photograph, unfortunately, of women only, and the software would undress the woman. Uh, also, as you can imagine, uh, caused a huge uproar online, was also taken down. So this was also a dramatic reveal on PowerPoint, so feel free to gasp as I scroll down through my PDF. Uh, if we name a tool uh, for spoofing voices, I mean, what else do you call it? <laughs> All right. So then dramatic fades black, because now you know we're doing dodgy shit. Sorry, that's probably not allowed. Woo! Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so um, how does Deep Throat actually work? The tool, guys. <laughs> Uh, so you just have a little bit of uh, your input data, which is the, the voice that you want to spoof. Magic happens, and then voila, you can just attack whoever you want. If only it was that simple, right? Um, so a, a kind of rough breakdown of this is that you would obviously need to have your targets in mind. Uh, so you have your input data, which you pass to this tool. It chops it up into 10-second clips, uh, which just makes it easier for the tool to work with. Uh, an optional step is passing it to a subtitle, subtitle API so that you can manually check if the, um, the tool is understanding what's being said correctly. It's then passed through um, a deep learning model. While this is all happening in the background, your attacker can prepare what I call the attack script. And once your spoofed voice is generated, the app will automatically create the phrases that you uh, put in the attack script. In order to make this attack vector as convincing as possible, the tool has a virtual audio cable which can pass the uh, audio from the tool to a phone call app. Um, when I did my testing, I was using Skype. The great thing about Skype is that 
Uh, you can make international calls. The number is not easily traced back to you. Also, if you want a free account, you can make calls for like 30 days and not have to pay if anyone <laughs> wants to do that. Um, something that I've read consistently in reports is about background noise. As soon as you have something like a baby crying or airp airport noise or something that uh, adds to the urgency of your attack script, it makes something seem a whole lot more believable. And then all you have to do is attack. Here is a wonderful video. Uh, it's, uh, it was part of some of my early proof of concepts. What I did is that I took a spoof of my voice and I thought, who can I fool? And the people that obviously know me best are my friends and family. So what I did is I just put together a very kind of short sentence. I said, there's a problem. I really need you to phone me. Uh, I had mall noise with the kids screaming. Um, and then I sent this as a uh, WhatsApp voice note to several people. Um, but I don't know if this is surprising or unsurprising, but it was good enough to fool both my father and a friend of 25 plus years. So there's definitely room for improvement, but it's convincing enough. So then I wondered, can I fool a bank? And the scary thing is I think I can. Um, and I got pretty close. Uh, the, w the only difficulty I had was um, an audio quality because at that point I hadn't figured out the virtual audio cable yet and I was doing it from a speaker uh, through to the Skype call which wasn't, very, um, wasn't great quality. Um, but the lady on the other side of the call was convinced enough that she was speaking to a real person. What worries me more, though, than a bank is what about fooling an entire nation? Um, there are general elections, generally the elections next year in America. Um, California has recently passed a bill where you cannot falsely distribute a deep fake 60 days before an election. If you do, you're liable to a whopping $4,000 fine and I think a month in jail. Now, if you think that you can kind of sway the election in an entire country and possibly influence international politics, $4,000 is nothing. Um, I also had a video here. Um, it was done, a journalist uh, has software, a deep fake software where uh, he's interviewing Putin. Uh, the one camera shows him where he's asking questions. He then runs to the other camera, which has the software enabled, and it makes his voice, his voice, his voice and his face look and sound like Putin. Um, so it, it's just, it becomes very difficult of like, seeing is no longer believing and neither is hearing. Um, and then as if it was magic, uh, this tool got released. There was also a dramatic pan, just so that if you missed the name, you can see it nice and clear. And this tool is pretty impressive. So I was planning to do a live demo, <laughs> which is not going to happen. This is also a video. Um, this was one of my tests. Uh, at least I can show you what the tool looks like and explain a little bit. Um, so what you do is that you're able to take a recording of a voice. You only need five seconds. That's how good uh, the software is becoming. So uh, the top spectrogram is the uh, actual input, the recording that you make. Uh, you then input a sentence in the top right. Uh, the tool uh, synthesizes and vocodes this into um, spoofed audio. Uh, if you can see on the left, uh, the circular dots is from the recordings. Uh, the X is the spoofed voice. So really what you want in terms of quality is you want that X to be as close to the uh, the circles as possible. Uh, I, I don't know how clear this is, but you can see that there is one X um, quite close to the dots. Uh, that was good enough to fool my mother. All right, so how do we stop this from happening? <laughs> yeah, not a not a great kind of mitigation, right? If anyone also wants to watch this video, it's amazing. It's uh, p uh, deaf people teaching you how to swear. Uh, that's bullshit, by the way, if anyone is interested. 
so yeah, so learning sign language is not an option. I also think, uh, I didn't realize there were a whole bunch of different sign languages. I think this is a huge missed opportunity for a universal language, but that's, I guess, a different talk. Uh, so mitigation, uh, trust but verify. Um, and if you think something is dodgy, trust your gut. It's generally good advice. Um, and as I mentioned, seeing is not believing and no longer is hearing. A phone call from someone that you know might not necessarily actually be from them at all. In my opinion, prevention is almost impossible. As soon as someone has a tiny kind of data set, the irony of doing these talks is that I must am making myself uh, vulnerable to this kind of attack, which I can appreciate the irony of that. Um, but the only advice that I can really give to people is that uh, if a service provider is using your voice print uh, as authorization or as the only form of authorization, I would opt the hell out of it. Um, there are already two service providers that I'm aware of in South Africa that are using this at this point in time. Uh, I'm not a big fan. And even though I don't necessarily have a problem with biometrics, I think that, again, convenience is has its place. But the, the massive difference for me between something like a password and biometrics is that a password you can change. Your biometrics you're stuck with. So as soon as something of yours is compromised, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so yes, yeah, so biometrics are not bad, but best to use them uh, in combination with something else. Uh, thank you for bearing with me through this disaster. And at the comedy store, and some idiot ran up on stage. He comes up to me during the middle of my set and tells me that we are in a simulation. The guy was drunk out of his mind. He was so drunk that he couldn't stand up straight. So we all laughed at him and let security escort him out. But now that we have deep fakes and fake voices, I'm starting to believe that we're not far off from simulations after all. All right, so I don't know if anyone here watches Joe Rogan podcasts. If you do, that's pretty believable, right? <laughs> no, everyone must hear what I'm doing. <laughs> it's not negotiable at all. Uh, this is great. Uh, what was next? Oh, duplex. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Oh, else here. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Sorry, I'm just going to pause that for a second. Um, what I want you to pay attention to is when Duplex is talking, it's learned to use aspects of speech like um, which is incredible because generally uh, what was easy to identify when you were listening to a machine is that it spoke perfectly. Whereas this is kind of, it's learning the nuances of human speech. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Feel free to applaud as well. <laughs> uh, 
this was actually a test just to see if you guys could remember the order of my uh, my presentation because clearly I can't. Uh, all right, so this is my proof of concept. It is Wednesday, the 17th of April. This is a proof of concept video for my Telspace research report. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm seeing if I can use my spoofed voice to fool my friends and family. So what I'm doing is I'm going to send a good friend of mine a voice note asking her to phone me. Hey Beth, can you please call me? I just need to ask you something quickly. Okay, she's online and she's listening to the voice notes. And there we go. She's busy calling me. That's wonderful. Also, shout out to Greg, who uh, did all my video editing. <laughs> Mad skills. Ah, here's the uh, the one with Putin. Uh, Mr. President, hello, Mr. President, can you hear us? Здравствуйте. Да, я вас слышу прекрасно. Hello, Cambridge. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's uh, it's wonderful to have you here with us. So, um, as as you know. Uh, people here are somewhat concerned. We have an election campaign coming up in 2020, and people are worried that Russia may uh, interfere with it, uh, uh, as it did in 2016, perhaps using more advanced technologies such as deep fakes. Uh, what, what do you have to say to that? All right, so look, obviously this isn't the best deep fake. You can see around his forehead that there's the discoloration of the skin and kind of like there are moments where the face freezes. But if this was done as good quality, um, I think it's so insidious because it doesn't matter about facts anymore. If you're able to create something uh, and plant a seed in people's brains. I think it's incredibly problematic and no one gives a shit about a $4,000 fine. I'm not actually sure. I'd have to check that for you. I think we can definitely try the demo. Um, this is the one I was able to record, so the audio happens right at the end. Um, everything that I explained to you guys, uh, I was going to explain while this video goes. Um, what, what is something that's quite helpful in the tool is that you want to have a really good quality spectrogram. Um, if you don't, obviously the software can only work with what you give it. So if you have a rubbish recording, it's not going to be able to do anything good with it. Um, these are these are fairly good quality spectrograms, both the input and the uh, generated speech. I'm doing a test to see what my spoof voice sounds like after only providing the tool with a few seconds of input. All right, so it's not the best. There's definitely room for improvement. Um, I think what would uh, make an, a huge difference and something that I would want to add to my tool is location because the accent makes a huge amount of difference. Um, part of my plans is to create a South African uh, data set uh, and see if I can get more convincing results using that. I don't think... I, the only thing else I can find possibly are the... Audio from Google. Oh, all right. So th these are not the ones that I'd put in my uh, presentation, but it will suffice. So I don't know if you guys can read because it does say which is which. 
She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. Okay, so there the first one was generated, the second one was um, recorded. George Washington was the first president of the United States. George Washington was the first president of the United States. To me, that's a really good example of the how close the generated speech is to the the recording of the voiceover artist. And I think that that is those those are all the videos. I'm just having a quick look. What are you? This two minute papers with Karo Zhona Fahir. Today we are going to listen to some amazing improvements. These are just in more examples of AI based voice cloning. For instance, if someone wanted to clone my voice, there are hours and hours of my recordings on YouTube and elsewhere. They could do it with previously existing techniques. But the question today is if we had even more advanced methods to do this, how big of a sound sample would we really need for this? Do we need a few hours? A few minutes? The answer is no. Not at all. Hold on to your papers because this new technique only requires five seconds. Let's listen to a couple examples. The Norsemen considered the rainbow as a bridge over which the gods passed from earth to their home in the sky. Take a look at these pages for Crooked Creek Drive. There are several listings for gas station. Here's the forecast for the next four days. All right, so uh, the order of that hasn't been very great. I hope you've been able to kind of keep track and not get too confused. Uh, Questions? Do you guys, is there a microphone that gets passed around? Is it, okay. Sure. At the moment, the tool that I've used has only done English, um, but because it's open source, there are other people creating uh, data sets for other languages, yes. There was another question there, right? Well, th th there are several factors. So if someone speaks really well and they announce it properly, of course, you're going to get a better um, audio from them. Um, it also depends on your actual device quality. So is the microphone good? Um, is the microphone terrible? Uh, how much ambient noise do you have? So there, there are quite a few factors that kind of influence your ability to make a, a really good spoof. Oh, I didn't repeat the question. I'm sorry. I'm bad at following instructions, apparently. Oh, it's, it's definitely being done, but not for the tool that I showed. Um, so Tacotron, yes, not the tool that I was showing. That was done just for English. 